was more than she could stand. So she would go up on the mountainside to these small villages and she would take her clothes off and she would explain about the body and she would have them look up her vagina and, you know, and, and talk about how to keep your health, how to space children, how women's bodies work. And I was mortified. <laughs> because my yeah. mother, here, I was about 10, 9 or 10, and I was just sure that someone was going to arrest my mother and she was going to end up in jail because of this. Yes, yeah, maybe. Maybe. And, and, you know, she, I can remember sitting in the kitchen one day and when she said to me, I know you're going to be upset with me, but I am not quitting this. Good and someday you will understand. Look what you turned into. And you will, <laughs> and you will stand up too. Yes. And, and I said, I don't think so. <laughs> well, that was wrong. Parents are embarrassed by everything their parents do. Absolutely. Their parents do nothing. <laughs> but it, you know, it's so funny because we all came from such diverse backgrounds, and I think that was one of the things that amazed me, is that not only was there not but there was a sense that there was an advantage in our differences. Mm -hmm. I learned, I have never learned so intensely, so much as I did in Northern Virginia now. It, it was very, very interesting. Now gave well, people, you know, a cha chance to lead and develop. We had a 19-year-old immigrant in our Capitol Hill Now chapter, and she suggested something. In our chapter, if you suggested something, you were automatically the head of the committee. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, well, I can't do this. And there was a chorus of voices from the room that said, why not you? <laughs> well, I think it, it's important the fact that we taught each other. We, we did. did. When Mary, when Marianne, when you talk about there were waves and waves and waves behind us politically, it's because you and Jane and, you know, Pat taught people. We and did taught each other how to make banners. banners. You know, Pat had this workshop of banners and and taught everybody Buttons. how to use plumbing, <laughs> plumbing pipes and, and you know, before now came out with these mass-produced yes. banners. We had banners. We had banners. I mean, wait, 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 I have to, this is got to remind me, I've got, I didn't need an answer. Because this did not originate with me. Who developed these hand faxes, sealers, or envelopes? Jean, um, <laughs> uh, Jean Lance and I. You and Jean Lynch. Feminist and the Yes. And do you remember all the, the stuff the stuff and lick parties that we used to have at each other? You make just... a little dick for the ERA. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hate to the camera running. Come on. <laughs> That's what I said. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
we couldn't do it, it would not be in good taste. Yeah. So oh, we had every single one. one. We literally <laughs> had a poor taste task force. We went out and did things in terrible taste. I mean, you can believe we did it well. We and I will never forget the, the meeting that I we laugh. had in front of <laughs> some of the conservative <laughs> office buildings downtown where no, Lenny had not. written the absolutely okay. wonderful press release with those little golden cufflinks, do you remember? Yes, yes. And which uh, they talked because we were we were standing there for the Seminole Life Amendment <laughs> because we felt that young men should wear handcuffs at night. So they did true. not know we borrowed that. that, <laughs> let, that us, let us not be guilty of, of plagiarism. <laughs> that came from a Mormon handbook for bishops. Yes, I in have which, copies still. In which the Mormon bishops were instructed that masturbation, I, I'm sorry, self-abuse, I guess they probably called it, was not a good idea and could usually be controlled by tight bed clothes. <laughs> However, and I quote accurately, in especially difficult cases, it may be necessary to tie a hand to the bedpost. Oh. <laughs> Mormons apparently are not ambidextrous. <laughs> <laughs> was that it was a day when rain, it began to rain, and here we were in our, in our white gloves and yes. our hats, our, you know, and <coughs> who should turn up at the demonstration to record it, but one of the stringers for Novak, and he thought it was a serious demonstration. <laughs> well, they were, to, there were a couple of other we were trying to keep serious. Yes, yeah. but on the far right, they all turned up. And it was hysterical, and we were trying not to laugh, and we were trying not to just completely and totally crack up. And there was a police officer who was, who, who knew us from, from <laughs> and board everywhere else, and he said, it's really cold, I'd invite you into the cruiser, but would that be insulting you? <laughs> no, but until we ended up sitting in it, it, we did. Did you notice the finale to that action? No, I don't. Two and a half years later, two, three years later, because that was the night before the right to Life March. Yes. We were trying to set the press tone for the weekend. <laughs> and it turned out we got no press at all that weekend. None. Which was discouraging, but we had a good time. We had a good time. Three years later, I was watching television. It was Channel 9, and I was on the phone with Lenny Burke, who had really spearheaded that particular action. And all of a sudden, Tim came on and said, Lenny, turn on Channel 9, turn on Channel 9, turn on Channel 9. It had film of that action on CBS. <laughs> It Ow. was being right to lifers. <laughs> yes, and it was hysterical. Oh, our sperms are people too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sperms. Sperm are people too. Pregnant and ironing our is our flaw. natural yes. state. This was something like the ladies and and, and, and DC and declawed. And, and I, all I could do was scream and, and, and then say, turn it on, turn it on. She caught the last 10 seconds of it. You know. well, and then it we had a huge debate as to whether we should call CBS, as was national news, and tell them to refile the footage, <laughs> or should we leave it there? Like they were do. And of course, <laughs> that was ERA Now, Epsilon Rho Alpha Now, which was an offshoot of Northern Virginia Now, when the folks in Northern Virginia Now, or a large group, decided that we had, were too political. We were a little and radical. Were, and it was the first group that ever said, you can't do this. And so we just took the whole Poor Taste Task Force with our slogan, mediocrity or less, <laughs> and our buttons. <laughs> and the bylaws, which were and on and our bylaws. And the button machine. And, and, and the button machine. So we went to e <laughs> Epsilon Rho Alpha, Alpha Now. That was for those who missed ERA Now, Epsilon Rho Alpha. They missed the Greek letter experience in college. <laughs> and so we were Epsilon Rho Alpha. And Epsilon Rho Alpha's, Georgia, you're going to have to help me out, bylaws. Specified a We're quorum. on a Bloomies bed. Yes, they originally, yes. Uh, they specified a quorum, and it's the verse, I think, in John. Oh, we're two or three, three or four. Where two or more gathered in my name. <laughs> and well, that was our quorum, and we just cited the Bible verse. <laughs> yes, oh, it was hysterical. So Lenny and I decided that there were two of us gathered together on the phone, and we decided to let CBS keep that tape <laughs> filed under right to life. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
So sperms are people too, may see the light of day. Sometimes. There was a forerunner of the For Forte's task force. And and that was Holy Crayola. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Because it was it was discovered that in Northern Virginia now that there was almost a hundred percent overlap between women in religion and women in the arts. Yes. So they just oh. decided to merge and call themselves Holy Crayola. And we did <laughs> one oh spectacular God. act. And yes. that spectacular action greeted me when I returned from Minneapolis. I was the at the uh, legal art mansion. I was at, well. No, this was but it oh, was legalized. Was. I this was, was the first. I was at the uh, Minneapolis General Convention for the Episcopal Church, where they actually voted that it was legal to ordain women. There had already been, I think, fifteen women ordained irregularly, but <laughs> then it made it legal. And I was coming back, sitting in the seat with an important. Uh, vestryman of the Episcopal Church in this area. We were talking about things. And I got off the plane and it was before all of the security so people could come, you know, right, right up where the gates where you yeah. came yeah. in. And I, you know, and the, went through the doors and here was this mob of people <laughs> holding signs that said, Holy Crayola, Georgia, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> And singing. And singing. Faith of our Faith mothers. Faith of our mothers living still in spite of bishops. <laughs> <laughs> and that guy disappeared really quickly. <laughs> this is actually related to a question I wanted to ask you. Uh -huh. um, because when Marianne and I were talking, one of the things that she was emphasizing to me was how, for many women, um, coming into this movement was deeply rooted in your spirituality. Mm -hmm. Not for everyone, but for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, we've sort of fabricated over time a real contradiction between these two things. Women being human and religion being valuable, I guess. We've kind of set it up so that these things are in competition. So um, how then did your faith or your interactions with your faith sort of guide you or, or push against you as you were working in the movement? What it, how did it influence the work that you were doing? For me, actually not really. Um, I, um, part of my uh, doctorate degree is in cultural anthropology, so that's one of the lenses that I tend to look at things through. And I was aware that, that no movement of importance import that had succeeded in this country uh, had, ha, had ever succeeded without some religious component to it. It was certainly part of the labor movement, the, uh, it was the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement. Um, so from a strategic point of view, um, I thought it was important that we begin uh, doing some liaisoning with women in churches and gradually build that kind of support into the movement. For me personally, uh, I was someone for whom the, the gospel message is one of social justice. Uh, it's not one of, of so much of rules and regulations, but how do you treat the poor people? How do you treat your neighbor? And the Apostle Paul said that, you know, that, that women and, and men and slaves and free are all one in Jesus. So I, I firmly believe that, and um, being a person of faith was really part of what I did. It's part of why I was willing to take risks, um, because I would feel it right in my gut. Um, I would feel it, well actually, when we decided to climb the White House fence, Yes. And this is a model of the ladders that we use to help us over the fence and how we created them is a wonderful story. But we had uh, just finished uh, a very compressed rash of uh, uh, direct actions. On Saturday we had chained shut the gates of the Mormon temple to protest Mormon interference with the Equal Rights Amendment. And those are the chains that we used. And then the next Monday was Alice Paul's birthday. birthday right. So we 
had uh, Lee Burned in effigy, Reagan and Judge McAllister, who was the Mormon judge who uh, attempted to defeat the ERA with a ruling that was rapidly overturned by the Supreme Court. Uh, and we were out in the streets getting arrested. And we, I, we came home sort of exhausted from, from those two actions and we had a meeting to sort of, we would always debrief what went well, what didn't, what can we do better next time, and what are we gonna do next? And I went home that night and I was lying in bed and um, at that time, one of my prayer positions was flat on my back talking to my ceiling. And I said, what should we do on Susan B. Anthony's birthday? This was about midnight, uh, maybe one o'clock. We'd had a really long meeting. And this, this voice bellowed down at me from the ceiling that said, climb the White House fence. <laughs> I was absolutely terrified. <laughs> I shook in bed until about four o'clock in the morning. Um, but, you know, the, as uh, Quakers would say, the euphemism we use is, that is a thought that would not have occurred to me. As William. And that's Quaker speak for, are you out of your friggin' mind? <laughs> well, the group thought I was out of my friggin' mind, and I was actually quite relieved when they decided not to do it. Uh, but then Marianne and, and Sonia sort of came back, and, and we did climb the White House fence. And what's curious about that is that we were so nervous about that action that we broke the rule that we had and we knew we had talked about it on the telephones. And we knew that some of our phones were bugged because we didn't rate high quality bugs was one of the reasons why we knew we, we were bugged. So Bugs were not high quality in those days. <laughs> so we all got together and we thought, oh crap, we talked about it on the phone, what do we do? So we went back on all the phones that we knew that were tapped, and we said, oh, damn, that was such a good idea. And we've tried, and we've tried, and we just can't pull it off. We're just gonna have to go back to the same old thing and chain the gates. So <clears throat> when we went over the fence, there was nobody there because all the police was hiding in the bushes by the gates with six sets of chain cutters with red plastic handles that they had just bought and tested <laughs> on the hay sure, to chains. To make sure they could cut the chains that they knew we had. So, and I had gone, so anyone that went over near the gates got arrested very quickly. But I went over in the middle and in all the role playing we ever did, we never thought we'd get more than 10 feet from the fence. So I had no plan. <laughs> you know? Well, and Cindy Schweitzer actually got up to the door to find us. You know, I'm 15 feet from the fence and I'm looking up and there's not a cop in sight. <laughs> oh, what do I do? You never can find a policeman when you want one. You know? <laughs> so I had to wing it as I went along. But the moral of this story is, that if the police authorities had tapped our ceilings instead of our phones, they would have known what we were doing. But they didn't. And the other thing was the Methodist building was a place where we met often. And when we were doing the arrestable actions as well as the White House vigil, uh, we would keep our, uh, all of our banners mm -hmm. at Covington and Burley. Mm -hmm. What <laughs> happened was that Vivian Ballard who was involved got so angry about the response of the government, you know, trying to arrest us even though we have permits and all of this. <clears throat> she went to law school and she became, she got hired over at Covington. And it was so interesting to me because we would, we would gather and then we would go down to Covington and Burling and collect our banners and come up to the White House. And to this day, I keep thinking to myself, of all of the people who, in an unknowing sense, supported us, I don't know that Covington and Burley really <laughs> understood that we were keeping our banners in their closet, and Vivi just did it. Did it. 
And I can remember the night, because we always were aware of being a legal action, because we knew the government was out to get us. There was no question. And they would change the rules on us week to week. Your banner can only be this 